requires when. It's uh, time for us to welcome um, our next guest, uh, who you all obviously know. It's time to meet John Wardley. There's three things I'd like to say regarding the air tunnel. <laughs> and they are, get a life. He's done many talks um, and a lot of us have attended them, so we thought the best way to go with this is kind of a question and answer session, you know, so you can ask what you want to know uh, rather than obviously, you know, maybe not getting the questions you want asked, answered. So but we're going to start with uh, one from me, a nice broad question to get it going. Uh, so John, how did it all begin? Um, okay, back in 1983, um, Madame Tussauds owned Chessington Zoo. Uh, it was uh, not doing so well, um, and I was asked to go along there, and my brief was literally, and these are the words they used, to sort out the fun fair and the circus at Chessington. Um, the court school had just been put into Orton Towers, and um, John Broom, who was the, the, the principal tenant here, prior to putting in the, the, uh, the corkscrew, Brian Collins had had the fun fair here. Uh, John Broom married uh, one of the Bagshaw daughters. The Bagshaw family uh, owned the towers. Uh, and John became the concessionaire that ran the miniature railway and the boating lake and the chairlift, or skyride as it is now today. Um, and um, he decided that he wanted to upgrade the amusement attractions here at Orton Towers and did a deal with some German travelling showmen and leased a corkscrew ride and a few other things. There was a Weber um, a dream boat, you might remember, um, I think there was a rainbow, polyp, a few other rides which, which were leased from German travelling showmen and uh, he charged one price to come in the park um, and you could ride the rides for free and everyone got very excited about this and, and it really did stir up the rest of the industry small amusement parks around the country really felt the pinch now Chessington as I say was owned by, by Madame Tussauds um, and it really wasn't doing very well and I was asked to sort out the fun fair and the circus and I I uh, looked around and I wrote a report which basically said I do not think the answer to Chessington's problems are to sort out the fun fair and the circus. Thank you very much indeed. And they said, well, don't call us, we'll call you. <laughs> and it was about a year later that I got a phone call from a guy and he said, you won't know me, but I'm new, the new man, one of the new directors at Madame Tussauds. I've just started and, 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 and Chessington is, is now um, my problem. And I found this rather enigmatic letter in my predecessor's filing cabinet. Um, and he said, from, from what I can, can read between the lines, when you say that you don't think the answer to Chessington's problems is sorting out fun for in the circus, reading between the lines, I think, I think you say you, you do know what the answer is. And I said, yes, I do. So he said, right, let's talk about it. And so I put together a scheme. Um, based on using fairly standard ride hardware but very heavily theming it having ridden many years previously big thunder at, at, uh, at, at, at disney um, i thought if we got a standard mac blarensian ride and slung a big plaster mountain over it we could produce relatively cost effectively um, our own uh, version of big thunder railroad i thought we could um, take a flume ride standard mac flume plenty of decoration and theming around it, turned that into a themed ride, and, and, and so on. So I put forward this scheme, little, little thinking, that they would turn around and say, OK, do it, which is what they did. Um, so uh, in 1987, we opened the first phase of 
Chessington World Adventures, and it was a huge success. It, it, it really did take us by surprise. And Pearson, who, who owned Madame de Swords, um, said, right, we, we haven't got any scope here to expand because there were very, very severe planning restrictions there. Um, we now want the brand leaders. We want something bigger and better than we can ever do at Chessington. So we then looked around and we looked at lots of sites around the country from Corby Steelworks through to Woburn Abbey. Um, and wherever we found a site that we could get planning permission, a brownfield site such as Corby Steelworks, um, we knew that it was going to cost a fortune just to make the place fit for public gaze. Whereas all the beautiful sites that we thought would make fabulous theme parks, such as, such as Woburn, um, we knew we'd never get planning consent, so we were in a bit of a, a mess. Uh, but then I heard through the grapevine that a lot of the resources here at Alton Towers, both financial and in terms of uh, personnel, were being bled dry by John Broom getting involved with the Battersea Power Station project. The Battersea Power Station project, back in Margaret Thatcher's day, it was going to be the greatest thing to be developed in London. Um, John Broom had nailed his colours to the mast, and at one point he went on national television saying that it was going to open on such and such a day at two o'clock in the afternoon, and he then famously said, and don't come at five past two or you'll miss it. And of course we all know that it, it never happened. But a lot of the management here were being drafted down to, to, to Battersea. Uh, a lot of financial resources were being poured into Battersea. And Alden Towers, as a consequence, was suffering. Investment here was suffering. Visitor numbers were dropping off. And we thought this might be an opportunity for us to acquire the basis of a site that is, is well located, slap bag in the middle of England, uh, with the basic infrastructure there, and we can then take it on and really build it up. So, um, Pearson, who owned uh, Madame de Swords, also owned Lazards, the, the merchant bankers, who were able to do um, a very thorough due diligence exercise on Alton Towers uh, and discovered that an awful lot of the assets of Alton Towers were not actually owned by Alton Towers. And as a consequence, if you bought Alton Towers, you didn't buy the corkscrew and you didn't buy a lot of other things. They were all leased or rented. And as a consequence, we were able to do a lot of preparatory financial work in advance of eventually Alton Towers being put on the market. So when Alton Towers was put on the market, Tussauds knew exactly what it was worth and what they were buying. Whereas all the other big players in the market, people like First Leisure and Granada, uh, immediately jumped in with amazing offers, far, far bigger than our offer. Um, and um, we, we realised that, well, we were out of the game. But of course, one by one, as these, these other players started to seriously look at the assets they were buying, they, re they realised that they weren't getting what they thought they were going to get, and that their offers were far too high. And one by one, they all pulled out, with the exception of us. So that's how we came to acquire Alton Towers. Uh, it all happened very quickly. Um, and um, on the day that, that we, we actually acquired it, uh, I was faced with the decision of having to sign a con well, not me actually signing the contract, but, but putting a contract in front of our chief executive, Michael Herbert, to sign for a big roller coaster that was being built by or, or proposed to be built by a company called BHS, and that's not British Home Stores. Um, <laughs> those of you that have, have heard of um, Werner Stengel, and, and he's quite a, a, a well-known name in our industry, he and, uh, and, and a partner had, had started a small company called BHS that did the Leesburg Barn at, at Leesburg, and were going to build um, a coaster um, virtually behind, well, more or less next to where, where 13 has been built, um, be behind where the corkscrew was. It, it was a, a big ride, um, and um, uh, it had as its main sort of feature uh, a racing element where the trains um, actually, there were two circuits to the track but one station. So you went up a lift, did one circuit, came back round, 
and then met the next train departing from the station and you went up a second lift and you raised it. Well, that's fine, but as, as you all know, you cannot absolutely be certain that you dispatch a roller coaster train dead on time. You will have, uh, for example, disabled guests that might be loading in, in, in from wheelchairs, you'll have elderly people that might be a bit slow, and the whole premise of this ride, in order to get the capacity, was you had to dispatch the train dead on time. And it wasn't going to work, and so I pulled the plugs on, on the whole thing and said, no, we won't build it. So we had to very, very quickly come up with some kind of proposal for a new ride. Well, the ride that was obviously greatly underused here was, was the Rapids ride. The Rapids ride was hidden behind a fence. If you didn't go on it, you didn't get to see it. And half the fun of a Rapids ride is, is standing and watching it. So I said, let's turn the Rapids ride inside out. Let's allow the guests into the center of the ride, get a flow route going through it, and that's when we put the runaway train in, which, which as you now know, weaves around the Rapids ride, and we created Katanga Canyon. Um, the, the Thunderlooper opened at the same time. The Thunderlooper had a temporary planning consent, and we knew that it was only going to be here for a short time. Um, so uh, after the, 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 the haunted house opened, we then turned our attention to what do we do on the Thunderlooper site, and that's how Nemesis was born. And I won't bore you with, with, with Nemesis and, and, and the, the, the making of Nemesis, because probably you've, you've already seen that presentation that I do on the making of Nemesis and how that came about. But that, that basically is the, the very early years of Open Towers, how we acquired it. Um, uh, I, in theory, retired at 2000, when because when, I was um, a, a non-executive director of, of, of Tussauds, um, and uh, there was a, 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 a sale of the company to, to, to <coughs> venture capitalists, and so the, the entire board resigned. Um, I agreed to stay on for a couple of years because we were in the middle of building air, so I didn't actually leave till, till 2002. But then when Merlin and Nick Varney took over uh, in 2006, 2006, oh, yeah, 2006, um, Nick Varney, who of course, as you probably know, was the marketing manager here when we did Nemesis, Nick Varney asked me if I would, I would come out of retirement, and I said, no, I'm very happy being retired, thank you. <laughs> um, he said, would well, I please come back as a consultant, and, and it's been a great privilege and honour to work with Mark and, and, and the team here, and with, with Candy and, and, and all the boys and girls at the studios in London. So that's, that's in a nutshell, um, how, how, it's, how it's sort of come about. So does anyone have any questions? Raise your hands. Hi, um, you say you've been in the industry for 30 years, and obviously when you started it was all kind of new to go upside down and stuff on like Nemesis and things. But nowadays you see all comments on the videos and stuff of I want more loops, faster and things like that. Does that make you work harder to make immersive rides like 13 and Subterra or does it make you just give up and put lots of loops in and stuff and just say yeah whatever? <laughs> yeah, it, it, that's an interesting question. I mean, the one, one thing that we didn't fall into the trap of during um, the 90s was joining the Iron Ride Race. As you know, when Nemesis opened, it opened against the big one at Blackpool, and Blackpool were, were promoting the big one as being the tallest, fastest roller coaster in the world. Um, so, um, you know, Nemesis um, was uh, n not tall, it wasn't fast, it wasn't the biggest, you know. We just wanted to build the best. Now, there's nothing wrong with the world's first of something, and um, certainly after we built Nemesis, we were looking for something different, um, and uh, Oblivion was the result. Now, B and M are a, a very, very closed company. They they don't market themselves in the way that, uh, or they don't promote themselves in the way that the other manufacturers do. Um, they they don't talk to anybody about what their plans are. But we had such a good relationship with them, with Nemesis, and they, they still consider 
that Nemesis is one of their finest inverted coasters, even though they've built dozens of them since that are two, three, four times as, as big and as high. But we have a very good relationship with with B and M, and I do with, with in particular with with, with Walter Bolliger. And um, so I think it's true to say that we're the only people that that do talk to them about new products and about new ideas. So um, after Oblivion, when it came to air. Um, we, we, we talked about a flying coaster, and, and, and it's interesting that it was Wayne that must have been the person that was hiding in the bushes when, when the trains arrived. Because I've, been, I've been searching for that person ever since. It's, it's, it's come out. The, it was very, very important that the whole industry wanted to know how we were going to get, get you into the flying position. Um, the coma had tried it, not particularly satisfactorily, by loading you on your back and turning you over. Um, and we worked with B&M for a long time on the principle of getting you into a seated position similar to Nemesis and then tipping the car. And we kept it very, very quiet, as much as for, for B&M's sake, because we knew it was going to be a product, of, a very successful product for them. Um, and so we kept it very quiet as to, as to how we were going to do it. Um, and then, subsequently, we've, we've developed the Wing Coaster product with them, which has gone into Gardenland and, and this year has opened, opened up at Thorpe. So there's, there's nothing wrong with World's Firsts, as long as it isn't a gimmick for the sake of a gimmick. And I think the, the, the ride itself has got to deliver um, a very, very special sensation. Um, so, you know, the, the, the World's First flawless coaster, people began to realise Flawless coasters really are not that exciting, they're not that special. So, um, whenever we do a, a real sort of world's first or, or record breaker, we want to make sure it's not for the sake of getting it in the record books. And of course, the, the flimsiest record you could, you could have is, is the world's highest, because next year someone will build one higher than yours, and there's no kudos in having the world's second highest anything. So we just don't go down that route. Um, as far as inversions, you know, inversions are great fun, uh, but not inversions for the sake of inversions if they don't improve the ride. So, uh, you know, that, 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 that's, that's my personal view, and I think, I think that's true of, 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 of uh, everyone here at Alton Towers. Okay. Hey, John. So, you said that one of the key things at Chessington was you were taking fairly basic ride systems and theming them really well and obviously that was really successful so why don't we see that sort of thing more more often in this industry nowadays? I think it's probably um, lack of realisation that escapism is still an important part of our industry that there really is no point in us providing the same sorts of rides that go to your village green or at a standard seaside amusement park and that the more we can uh, take you into another world although it's only for a short period of time and it might be a very superficial thing but it, it does add to the fun and uh, by decorating the rides, by theming them up, by adding effects and, and so on it, it does make for a much, much bigger, fuller experience, I think. Um, and it's probably just lack of imagination on, on the part of others, that, and, and maybe lack of budgets as well. Um, the actual embellishment of our rides can account for 50% of the cost of a, of a ride or attraction, but we just think that it's very important. It, it sets us apart from the competition. It's dead easy to go to a uh, manufacturer, whether it be Vicoma or whoever, and say, this is, this is the site, would you please design us a roller coaster? And the only thing that the creative department have to do at the park is think of a funny name for it. And, and we just don't go down that route. You know, we, we, we put a lot of time and a lot of effort into the way we present our rides, and I really do think it makes them special. Otherwise, I don't think we'd all be here today. Hi, John. Um, in previous projects, there have been Easter eggs, um, if you will, in, in different 
design aspects of the ride. So, for example, on Oblivion, you've got the SW4 on the, on the side of the column. Do you enjoy teasing the enthusiast community with these Easter eggs, and do you think we'll see any more of them in the future? Well, to be honest, I've never really, I've never really focused on them. It, it, it's pure coincidence that someone in the, you know, in the design department was looking for some graphic to put on something, and that's what they put on. I don't think we set out to, to, to put these teasers in at all. You, you, you all know how the, the, the secret weapon SW thing came about. I'm sure with the our pipeline coaster that never happened here. Um, you know the first the first layout. You know, and I've I've got the drawing to prove it. I I mark SW1. Uh, the amended layout was SW2, and then the, the the first Nemesis plans were SW3, and so it's gone on from there. And it's a it's a it's a sort of code word that we've always used internally because of course the actual name of the ride doesn't materialise until quite a long way down the project uh, program. So you've got to have a code name for a project, and that's how it sticks. But I, I don't think we, we, we set out to titillate or, or, or tease people with these things. I mean, although we are actually cause, calling you know, next year's project for the time being SW7, um, you know, it, it's just convenience, really. So, so the, the Easter eggs you talk about, uh, you know, we, I don't think we set out to do this at all, no. Hello John, I've got a question which is quite dear to your heart, which is the subject of dark rides. Mm. The UK seems to exist in a bubble outside the rest of the industry, mm. where we don't focus on these dark ride experiences in the country. Mm. We've got parks over in Europe and over in America opening stuff such as Transformers, the new Harry Potter ride, revitalising Spider-Man, and things such as Efteling opening dark rides that are absolutely stunning. In this country, especially within the Merlin parks, we don't seem to see any focus on these. Do you think at any point in the future Merlin may go down this route? Will we ever see anything like Spider-Man in this country? Well, I think that's an excellent question. Um, right, let, let, let's, let's, let's start off with, with the basics. The, the, the dark ride that, that is dearest to my heart, I suppose, is the original Bubble Works at Chessington, which, which I did on a, on a shoestring. I mean, we had to open a dark ride, we had to do it very quickly, and, and the Bubble Works was done on a shoestring, and I think it worked extremely well. But as soon as you start to produce a more sophisticated type of ride, that is where budgets absolutely race away. So money is, is, is one of the stumbling blocks, which is the reason why all the rides that you mentioned are in sort of money no object parks. Efteling doesn't have to run at a profit, it's a charity and they've got money coming out of their ears. Um, <laughs> the, other, the other parks were obviously Disney and Universal, but they're, they're in a, a, a different league to us. They can afford to invest uh, 35, 40, 50 million dollars on, on a ride without blinking. So money is, 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 is one thing. But the other thing which is just as important is the question of intellectual properties. Um, hole in the wall attractions, as we call them, are very, very difficult with it, without an intellectual property. Um, Hex was a very good example. If you just have an attraction which cannot be seen from outside, people don't know what it is, uh, it doesn't have a well-known brand associated with it that immediately fires people's imaginations, then it's very, very difficult to, to make that ride work commercially. But as soon as you've got an intellectual property, such as Harry Potter, such as Transformers, such as Spider-Man, that's when you can make it work. And, and these are things that we're, we're looking into. Uh, Merlin now has a, a, a division that, that is, is looking into uh, intellectual properties. One of the problems, of course, that, that we and, and other parks around the world that don't own the intellectual properties in the first place is that by the time one is aware that an intellectual property is a big success, the chances are it's reached its zenith, and by the time you have then designed a ride and exploited that intellectual property, it could be on the way down. Whereas the likes of Disney and Universal are able to conceive their new rides and attractions at the same time as they're conceiving the new films and launching them all together. But I think it's true to say that Merlin also have an iron in the fire in that, in that way now. So, uh, so you can watch this space. 
Does that answer the question concerning dark rides? Because it, it, it's an interesting one. There are very, very good reasons why why dark rides are, are, are tricky things. And um, uh, yes, it is something dear to my heart. I, I do believe that dark rides have got a big place in our, in our industry. And um, and I, I, I sincerely hope in the next few years we'll be we'll be developing more of them. With dark rides, um, do you think the public might respond better if it was incorporated with a roller coaster like Raptor Attack in Lightwater Valley or Scuba Doo in Australia? Do you think that would help with the public's perception of the ride? Was they could see it was a roller coaster in a building. Well, as soon as you put a roller coaster in the building, the the, the effects are fairly irrelevant. Um, I mean, if you take the rock and roller coaster, uh, the effects in the rock and roller coaster just consist of a few bits of flat cut out fluorescent painted you know scenery um, and things like uh, the mummy returns an awful lot of those effects if you walk around the, the mummy returns uh, you, you'll see that the effects are extremely sophisticated but um, uh, there you're using a transit system as really a high-speed dark ride transit rather than, than just a roller coaster um, the, one of the main problems that we would have here um, is you you need a gigantic building to put a meaningful sized ride that is fast, in other words, will take a lot of track uh, and put it in a building. And we would never get planning permission here for a building on the scale of uh, any of the, the, the big roller coaster dark rides that you mentioned, which are colossal. Um, so so th th that's a big drawback. Once you've got the big building, it's relatively easy to bug a roller coaster in and, and put some effects in, and providing you've got an intellectual property that then draws them in, then you've got a successful attraction, and it's not difficult to do it. Um, I, I, I hope many years ago, when we, when we put the Wild Mouse in at Chessington, that we would be able to completely encase that in a building, because a Wild Mouse dark ride, if you've ever ridden, there aren't very many around, a couple in America, but, but you put a Wild Mouse like a standard Mac or Gerstlauer, one of those track layouts, inside a building and you're whizzing around through partitions and so on, um, light it with some black light, you get a really fun ride. But it, it, it involves a huge building to enclose such a big roller coaster. You either do that or you actually just enclose the track in a series of tunnels as they did at Cedar Point. And then you, it, it's just like a gigantic worm on the park and it looks hideous. So, um, <laughs> Yeah, it's, 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 not, it's not easy, um, but, uh, but it, 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 it can be done. <coughs> Just a quick one from the website, because some people did put some in from there. Um, how has the enthusiast community had an impact on Mel, Mel and Befala Two Swords developments, if at all? Well, I can't really answer that from Merlin's standpoint, but I can from my own personal standpoint. There are, the difference between your forum and a lot of the others is, in general, your forum is, is, is positive. There's nothing wrong with criticism, but your, your negative comments are made in a positive way. What, what, what really does annoy me, and, and we just switch off, are, are these websites where you've basically got a lot of cowards that hide behind the internet and just, just slag us off in a non-constructive non way. I've got no time for that at all. The internet, you know, is, is, is uh, there are a lot of um, people that haven't got the guts to stand up and face the world and they do that behind, behind the, the anonymity of the internet. Whereas your forum doesn't work that way. In, in general, your, your comments are, are, are sensible. You know, they're, they're, they're fun and light-hearted, but they're sensible. And um, where you have got negative comments, and you're very, very welcome to voice them, it's done in a positive way. So I, th I think that's, that's quite important. Um, sometimes I, I marvel at the intuition that, that, that you show. Um, as, as I think someone said before, generally speaking, when people start writing comments saying, um, I know someone who works at the park who told me that such and such and such and such is definitely going to happen. They are the people that are talking out of their backsides. Um, you, you don't need to take a blind bit of notice. Whereas uh, there was one, one guy, I, don't, I can't remember who it was, but it was on your site, who um, very quietly came up with 
uh, just a few sentences speculating on what 13 was going to be all about and it was spookily accurate it really was extraordinary and and i thought you know here's here's someone that really has been quietly thinking and, and they they got it right they really had and then subsequently some no limit simulations appeared on youtube that were very very accurate so it, it's it's the intelligence that, that that you show on towers times which we find or i find useful and i don't switch off i, I do do read whereas on an awful lot of the other sites you you get through a few postings and you just think this is childish and, and switch it off yeah. any more questions oh yeah not this way. Hi. Um, if you would have joined Two Swords or Orton Towers a little bit later, so say the weird Julie thing had been built, how do you think that would have affected the park in the future? It, what had been built? The weird Julie coaster thing. That oh, oh, right. Yeah. Well, well yeah. <laughs> We'd, we'd have had to have put up with it. We'd have, we'd, have, we'd have got made the best of it and found found a way of, of, of you know making it popular and then and then moved on. I mean there were lots of there were lots of things when we acquired Orton Towers that that were not right and, and the Rapids ride was a good example. I don't suppose any of you can remember the Rapids ride as it was, but it was rather like the the log flume is now, where um, until you went through a, an entrance next to where the lock flume entrance is now um, and along a chain link fence um, queue line you didn't get to see the rapids ride and and it, it was it was a terrible waste so katanga canyon didn't exist so we were able to take what was here which wasn't right and turn it around um, and um, and so I'm sure we would have done done the same with with, with, with the dueling coaster, but I'm very glad that we didn't because if we if we if we had uh, acquired that dueling coaster, we wouldn't have had the money to build the runaway train in the haunted house, for example. So it's just use of capital. it does seem that we've never had a ride since Nemesis that's been as intense. Do you think that there's a tendency now to try and make rides too smooth and graceful rather than be outright extreme G machines? Um, no, I don't think intensity comes into it. Um, ne Nemesis uh, was an interesting one because the actual layout and profile of Nemesis um, is not that dissimilar from the first B&M um, inverted coaster that went into Six Flags in Chicago, which was the one that Nick Varney and I went to ride before we put Nemesis in here. Um, just quickly recapping for those of you that don't know the story, um, we, we were planning the, the, uh, the Arrow pipeline for, for the Nemesis site, um, I went and rode the prototype um, in the Arrow factory in Utah and it was a, a dreadfully slow, boring ride. It was obviously not going to be an exciting ride and we pulled the plugs on the project and we, we, we had to think very, very fast. And then I heard that B&M were putting a new kind of coaster into Six Flags in, in Chicago um, and myself uh, well, first of all, we, co we contacted B&M and they would tell us nothing at all about it. And then um, I contacted uh, a, a colleague of mine who worked for Six Flags and said, um, uh, if we scratch your back, would you scratch ours? And we agreed on it, we would do them a little favour if they tell us what this ride was, because the rumour was it was a coaster that was below the track that went through inversions. And we knew from our experience with the Vampire at Chessington that that was impossible. Um, so he said, OK, I will give B&M um, the clearance to talk to you about it. And they did. And we, we then went and, and rode, Nick Varney and I rode um, the ride at, at Six Flags in Chicago. And we sat down with B&M and reprofiled it, re well, did a complete new layout um, and reprofiled it. But in terms of intensity, um, 
the, the, the BLM inverters have not got more intense since we did Nemesis, um, and one could argue that um, Nemesis is, is as intimidating a ride as our guests really want or need. You know, we have to keep aware, be aware of the fact that we are a family resort, that although roller coaster enthusiasts want the world's most terrifying ride, it's not necessarily the right thing for here. We want to produce things that are bigger and better than other parks, better being more important than bigger, of course. Um, and intensity it isn't necessarily um, the most important thing. It's, it's fun and excitement and exhilaration and so on. So, um, uh, perhaps with Nemesis, you know, the fact that your, the, the safety envelope was deliberately designed to go very close to the rock, uh, so that you thought you were going to graze your feet and all that sort of thing. It does make for a very, very exciting ride, but, but there are others that find, for example, Oblivion more in intimidating than Nemesis. There are lots of people that won't ride Oblivion, but they will ride Nemesis. So, um, you know, we, we, are, we are still, still creating um, very thrilling, very intense rides, and I think you'll find next year something pretty thrilling and intense. Um, <laughs> Uh, so, um, no, it, it, we're not softening our rights for, 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 for any reason, no. Hi John, um, what new attraction built, either built this year or if you can't think of one in the last few years, have you been most impressed by um, outside of Merlin Park, I guess? Outside of Merlin Parks? Yeah, I don't, I don't want to give you like... I don't want you to feel like you have to say, oh, the swamp. Um, <laughs> Just because you work for them. <laughs> well, actually, I only rode swamp for the first time a couple of weeks ago. And I still haven't ridden the ride in Gardaland, even though, you know, I did, did the layouts and profiles of both those rides. Um, so I, I, I don't... Um, I don't travel around in the way that I used to. You know, I, uh, sort of when I was when I was full time um, with, with with the Tussauds crew, um, uh, I was I was going to uh, the IARPA convention every year and going to all the parks around the world. Now now it takes a lot to prize me from my my home. So um, yeah, I, I I think I think in terms of stuff that we've been doing recently. I've got a tremendous amount of admiration for 13. 13 was a, was a real challenge where we set ourselves almost an impossible task of producing something that will give a thrill to teenagers, but at the same, same time, families with young children, grandparents and, and grandchildren, would be able to go on that ride and have a whale of a time. And, and that's really the, the ethos of, of Alton Towers Resort. You know, it isn't, it isn't roller coaster heaven. It never was intended to be roller coaster heaven. Um, it, it, it's for, for everybody. The mere fact that we've got some of the finest roller coasters in Britain, and if you talk to Ace, they'll, 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 they'll rate Nemesis and, and, and Oblivion way up the top of, of, of world coasters as well. But, but um, 13, it, it was an interesting one, and, and, and those of you that were at my presentation, what was it, the year before last, on, on the making of 13, we had a great deal of fun with that, taking a roller coaster and doing something that had never been done before. Um, putting putting that, that free fall track in, launching you backwards off the track into a dark section, all those sorts of things. And, and the combination of, of that, it was a case of thinking outside the box. You know, it, other people weren't thinking along those lines. Um, and, and the things that, that, that were done both here at Alton Towers, technically, because you know, that ride is a very, very complicated piece of kit. And those of you that were here were, well, did we, did we take you backstage when the ride was running? I don't think we were able to, were we? But if you were fortunate enough ever to be in the top of the drop zone when it's running, it really does come home to you how that ride sequences. Because when you ride 13, you think you're the only train on the track, even though you know there are some other trains around. But, but if you stand up on that, on that uh, viewing gallery, and you watch the way it sequences. Basically, a train comes in, the roller shutter comes down, the track drops, the train is fired off backwards. As soon as it has cleared the track, 
the track comes back up again, the roller shutter opens and the next train comes in. As fast as that, the sequencing bit, that piece of track is going up and down, up and down continuously all day. And Terry Dunn and the team here, all those, all, all the maintenance people, do an amazing job keeping that thing, keeping that thing running. And similarly, Candy Holland and the studios, their creative abilities in, 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 in the way they, they devised and designed the whole of that ride is, is, is amazing. And it's that that makes Alton Towers Resort special. You know, it's, it's not doing the obvious. All right, at times we might try something and it might not work. That doesn't happen very often, but it's far better to do that and occasionally maybe not get something completely right than to not try things at all and do the obvious all the time as some other parks do. You know, whenever, if something is not quite right, we, we get our teeth into it and we get it sorted. But, um, you know, that, 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 that's the important thing with, with, with Alton Towers, to have the guts to try things, to do things different, to make things special and not do the obvious. Just another quick one from the internet. Um, what involvement did you have with the Swan at Fort Park? Right, what, what tends to happen, and somebody asked earlier about, about how we do things, um, the park will decide the type of attraction it wants for a particular year. So it might be a family fun ride, it might be an intense thrill ride or whatever. Um, and in the case of Alton Towers, one of the first things we look around for is where on earth can we put it on the park where we might get planning consent. You cannot believe how difficult this is. You, you track very closely our planning applications and good luck to you, but you have no idea what the, the hoops that we have to jump through before we actually put that planning application in. It, it, there is a huge amount of work done by Mark and the team here. So we will get a feeling that, for example, we might be able to put a ride somewhere behind where the corkscrew is now, and we will discuss this with the planners. In parallel with this, we will be looking around for different types of technology that, that, that manufacturers have, have been thinking about. In the case of B&M, it's a case of talking to them very quietly behind the scenes um, as far as uh, they, they ask for our ideas and we ask for their ideas and so on. Um, and then the marketing people here at Alton Towers and Candy Holland and the team uh, at, at Merlin Studios in Acton then start to come up with the concept. Um, once the concept is starting to mature and the kind of ride is, is, is decided upon, that's when I come in and I start putting squiggly lines on a bits, bits of paper and plans and then I, I, I use No Limits. Um, no Limits is a very useful tool. The piece of No Limits hardware that I've got is, is, is not the standard that, 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 that's available but it's a very handy, handy piece of kit so we, we will use No Limits to start shaping it up and that then enables everybody at the park to get a feeling of what the ride might be like sensations and so on and it enables our landscape architects who are going to be drawing up the plans the planners to produce three-dimensional drawings so that's that's the sort of way it works um, and and the processes we go through um, in in the case as i said b and uh, we have a very good relationship with them and we have pioneered uh, a number of their their rights for them uh, on the understanding that we can have exclusive for a few years before they then sell it to other, other customers. Um, and um, uh, if any of you have ridden Swarm at, at Thorpe, it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a super ride, I'm very pleased with it. And interestingly enough, um, uh, literally the day after Swarm opened um, and uh, somebody had posted on YouTube uh, an on-ride video of the ride, I, I played that on my laptop and I had my main PC next to it with the original No Limits simulation I'd done 18 months, no, two years before and the two were identical, absolutely identical. So that proves that, that, that No Limits is a very, very handy tool for us. Yeah. Of the ride manufacturers you've, wor um, you've worked with, which have you found the easiest and best um, to work alongside? Well, I, th I think it's true to say that, that, that B&M are, are the easiest. They're, um, 
They have a great, there's a great deal of mutual respect between us and, and, and B&M. Um, they're a very quiet, considered organisation, um, and uh, they're, they're delightful to work with. The, 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 their, their products are the most expensive, without a shadow of doubt, you, but you get what you pay for. Uh, and for every every million pounds you spend with, with, with B&M, you get a million pounds worth of value. Um, the, you know, the, the, the basic secret of B&M, and I'm sure you all know this, is, is the pattern that they have on, on their track and where they produce the spine beam. And it then takes all the guesswork out of the, the tube bending. No other manufacturer can do this. No other manufacturer has ever been able to bait, make roller coaster trackers as good as B&M's track. But it's not just that, it's the backup service that we get from them. And we have a good relationship with the other manufacturers, you know, Intamin and, and, and Gerstlauer and, and, and the other manufacturers. They're all, all, all good people. And it's horses for courses, you know. There are some types of ride that, that you go to a particular manufacturer for. Other types of ride you'll go for to another manufacturer. <coughs> yeah. um, there's two more questions, so if you desperately want to get one in, now is your time. Someone down at the front has been desperate for you. In regards to creating an experience instead of just a ride, would you feel that the interactivity of Jewel has sort of destroyed um, well, <laughs> yeah. The, the problem with shoot 'em up dark rides is the the rider is so involved in the activity of firing up little red dots in the dark that you could actually put anything in there, and, and uh, you know it's it's not that relevant. So, um, uh, yeah, um, I'm, I'm not I'm not a great lover of shoot 'em up dark rides. Um, uh, but it's something that um, uh, people want and people like, and it enables one to refresh a, a, a you know an old ride. Um, and um, yeah, the public like it. So. <laughs> IPs and um, external brands. Um, mainly in two swords, I've had quite good brands, Nemesis being one of them. You've got Nemesis of Terra and Nemesis of Fena. What other sort of brands can you see mainly building on, and how far do you think we could go with certain brands as well? Well, because of the way, uh, because of the amount of thought and effort that goes into um, designing a brand around a new attraction. Um, and a huge amount of thought goes into it, far more than any other park, I would say, certainly in Britain. So, you know, we don't go for the obvious. I mean, nobody, nobody would think of calling a ride 13, for example. I mean, it's the last name that you would think of. Or in the case of uh, Air, I, I, I mean, it's, it's, it's a case of thinking outside the box. And that then enables you to really develop a brand with, with, a, with a, um, a distinctive logo. Um, it then enables you to develop a product range of merchandise, which is, is very important to us, as, as Andrew at the back knows very well. You know, he, 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 the, the merchandising off the back of our, of our ride brands is, is extremely important to the commercial viability of, of, of our parks. Um, so the branding, um, we, we, we've, we've done it actually, we've exploited the brands. Um, with Nemesis we did a, a branding exercise with Coca-Cola, as you may remember, for the first year. And it was probably the most disgusting flavoured soft drink that I've ever tasted. <laughs> but it was, it was very successful. Um, and I think we will probably now, under Merlin's ownership, be, be developing our brands far more our own creative intellectual properties and, and licensed intellectual properties. So I think it, it, it's a good point and, and if, you, if you watch this space you will see more and more of this integration of rides with other media. Yeah. Um, okay, um, I don't think I'm saying that John will be around for a bit so if you have some questions I'm sure 
you can come up and ask him. Um, that's it for this part. Of, um, big thank you to John for coming in. And uh, if I can persuade her, Liz as well. Can I? Yes, I can. Excellent. And John, don't go away. <laughs> Obviously, uh, we've had a lot of support on this event uh, from Alton Towers, um, so we've got a few little gifts for everybody. I've got picks of the right bags. Yeah, so this one's for John. Thank you very much, John. Thank you very much. Happy birthday, Thank you very much again for your talk. And, um, no, I don't know how many people know Liz. You've probably seen her name in some... Liz will now give us a two-hour talk. <laughs> <laughs> Liz won't. <laughs> uh, she's been crucial in uh, getting this event together, um, so we wanted to give her a little gift as well. That's not much for you. <laughs> so, we are going to bore you for a little bit longer. Um, but if you want to have a quick five minute break so we can do the last little bit and then you should get a bit of time hopefully on part before we go on to the behind the scenes. So a little bit of a break and a big thank you again for... <laughs>